All right, thanks so much for doing this, Scott. Um, I was wondering if you could first introduce yourself and then tell us why the aid model is broken. Sure. Um, my name is Scott Gilmore. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Peace Dividend Trust, which is a social enterprise that connects local entrepreneurs to international supply chains. Um, before that, I was a diplomat for the Canadian government uh, overseas in places like Afghanistan and Timor, um, which is, gets right to the question of why it is broken. When I was in that role as a diplomat, I saw that we were spending millions, hundreds of millions, actually $2 trillion since the 1950s as an entire aid community, and achieving very little on the ground for our efforts. And that the progress that you did see on the ground was coming not from aid programs, but from natural economic growth that was being driven by local entrepreneurs. And the reason this is, is that we've set up some negative feedback cycles in the, in the aid industry over the years. Um, we have been funding aid programs with government money that has required uh, extensive reporting to make sure that the money is being spent in a, in a responsible fashion and which doesn't emphasize the impact of the money. And so the organizations that have been spending the money have increasingly become much better at reporting and have set aside the impact issues. And so generation after generation, we've ended up with aid implementing agencies that are fantastic at writing CETA reports, but lousy at actually creating jobs. Um, and this has been widely recognized, not just in, in Canada, but elsewhere. And so we're beginning to see a shift away from planning for aid to using entrepreneurs to create growth. And how, how do entrepreneurs cut through those institutional barriers? Well, you know what? Let me uh, illustrate with, uh, with two examples. The first one takes me back to when I was a diplomat in Timor, and I was working for the United Nations and was responsible for trying to create an economic security strategy and was failing at it. But every day when I went home from work feeling fairly depressed about the prospects for East Timor, I would see uh, my landlord, a Timorese named Signor Antony, who was taking my rent checks and hiring local boys to help him rebuild some burnt out buses. And first check he bought some tires, a second check he put in a new engine. Eventually he had a, a working bus and soon he had a fleet of buses and was the single largest employer in our neighborhood and created this island of prosperity in a sea of, of, of poverty. And meanwhile, everything that we were doing in the United Nations had yet to bear any fruit whatsoever. In fact, ultimately, a lot of it bore no fruit at all. And another example uh, is that when we do our work now in places like Afghanistan, um, we're often met with, with uh, aid industry insiders and aid planners who are very skeptical of the ability of Afghan entrepreneurs to, well, first of all, that they even exist and that they can produce goods and services. But uh, we have over 9,000 Afghan businesses that we work with in Afghanistan who have been able to not only uh, thrive as businessmen, but survive some of the most horrific social and security challenges of the last 30 years. So the reason, uh, the reason I raise these two examples is in both cases, you had entrepreneurs who, who have seemingly nothing. You know, in East Timor, everything was flat and Senior Anthony was left with nothing but uh, the burnt out remains of a house. Uh, no startup capital and no apparent skills. In Afghanistan, you could say the same thing, that the Afghan country has been leveled again and again and again and leaving the private sector with almost nothing to start with. But what they have is entrepreneurial ability to create something from nothing just through sheer perseverance and innovation and dogged determination. And um, it's that what creates jobs. It's not aid planners. It's not uh, new strategies to leverage stakeholder uh, interventions in the sectors of support market development. That's all BS. What creates jobs is a local entrepreneur is trying to come up with a better way to bring some money, uh, some food home for his family. That's a model for, for job growth. Can entrepreneurs address other components of aid, whether they're humanitarian relief or whatever, whatever they might be? Well, there's, there's a limit, right? I would say that they can, they can address a lot more than we realize. For example, I argue that job growth is at the base of everything. You know, once uh, you have a job, you can start feeding your family better, raise nutritional levels, you can afford a doctor for your wife when she goes into labor. After the child is born, you can ensure it gets medical, uh, regular medical attention, that it gets its, its, uh, its polio vaccinations, and that that child goes to school. And once it become, the child becomes educated, they then take on aspirations of greater independence and success and, and, and good governance. The other things the private sector development does through entrepreneurs is they begin to increasingly demand responsible government. Um, when they recognize that the local government is hindering their ability to do what they do, they start demanding transparency, and they start uh, pushing for anti-corruption efforts. And in many cases, you're seeing, like in Afghanistan, the private sector is coming together 
and trying to push for actual peace and stability because they recognize that you know they can't prosper unless the, the warring parties come together. But there are limitations. Uh, for example, humanitarian assistance. When you take a look at uh, what happened in, in, in Haiti, for example, um, the private sector could not respond to that uh, in, in short order. Um, however, I would point out, though, that 24 hours after the, or sorry, not 24 hours, but a week after the earthquake in Haiti, uh, the Peace Student Trust team in Afghanistan had already documented over 350 um, export-capable companies that could provide goods and services that were necessary for reconstruction were already up and running less than a week after the earthquake. And so while they might not be the first responders, um, they're right on the heels of the first responders, and that's something we forget. What should we do then with the big state aid institutions like CEDA and DFID and USAID? Do they, or do they play a role in this, or do they disappear? Well, um, they're always going to play a role, uh, I think, to a certain extent, but the question is, is what role? For example, let's take a look at aid policy. If you take a look at all the great conceptual innovations that have occurred in aid over the last 20 years, whether it was a microfinance or crowdsourcing information like Yushahidi has so successfully done in, Afga or in, in Africa, none of these ever came from the bowels of an aid agency of bureaucracy. They came from the outside. And so I think that there's, there's huge chunks of the policy uh, work that these aid agencies do that is not only redundant, it's, it's useless and they, they should be gotten rid of. Um, but there are things that, um, that uh, aid can be very successful at. So to give you an example, the Canadian Finance Ministry, which you wouldn't consider to be an aid agency, recently contributed $20 million as an X prize to come up, for, come up with new ideas, innovative ideas on how to uh, provide finance to small and medium-sized businesses in the developing world. So they put this money on the table and they invited the entire world of NGOs and finance companies to say, we want a brand new idea that's going to change the lives of the, some of the poorest people in the world and the winner gets this money. And now that's brilliant and that's the sort of thing that only governments can do and uh, as we've seen with the, you know, the, the real X Prize in, with the space race, it can lead to generational leaps in uh, how we address some of the, the most wicked problems that we're facing.